So it's due on the first, but you have up until the fifteenth. Uh, you know, up until the fifteenth to to make that payment. After the fifteenth, you're going to consider it late. Okay. Of course, I would encourage people to pay prior to the fifteenth, right. pay as early yeah. as possible. But you know, most most companies will allow you to pay up until the fifteenth. So as far as pre-approvals, you know, a lot of people don't know. Uh, I, I'd say younger people don't know. Mm -hmm. um, what a pre-approval letter is. Um, could you kind of elaborate on that and you know how long they last for someone that would go to a lender and yep. receive one? Yeah, so pre-approval is basically the bank saying, all right, based off your credit report and the information you either told us or that we have, uh, we'll loan you X amount of money but there's no commitment from us, the bank. Mm -hmm. We're not committed because things could change. Um, but it's a good way for you know, realtors, um, sellers to say, okay, this person has at least been verified by credit worthiness. Mm -hmm. And sometimes on the pre-approval, it will say verified by, you know, income and assets as well, which also shows like, okay, they have a legitimate chance of getting approved. Mm -hmm. So um, the time frame is going to vary. Typically 90 days though, so three months is when it's good. Now your credit report, which is gonna get pulled, has 120 days, so it's four months long. A lot of times if you're working with a lender and they know your credit's about to expire and uh, you update some documents, because some of your documents will expire, they'll usually extend your pre-approval up until the credit report expires. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. That's so good. yeah, pre-approval is like a resume. You know, you, you submit your resume into a job, right? Mm -hmm. The employer looks at your resume and sees if you meet qualifications. Mm -hmm. That's how a, a lender does. It's like your resume, but you might not have got the job yet. Mm -hmm. You might have an interview, mm -hmm. such as pre-approval, but you haven't got the job yet. Absolutely. I like that. I like that analogy. And anybody paying attention, anybody looking right now, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask in the comments. Like I said, whether you see it now or later, don't hesitate to drop any questions or just contact us, and we'll make sure we get you an answer so we can... Yeah, sure, we'll, right, we'll, we'll post our, our contact info um, after after this. We can Absolutely. post it in there. Yes, my so the flyer as well now. I need you. So I, I know you kind of you touched touched on it just now, but mm -hmm. I wanted to ask. About, I wanted to ask about um, like expenses and things that can affect one's credit score. Yeah, so so as far as expenses, um, you know, if somebody's purchasing a home, I would definitely encourage limiting any new credit, so any new credit inquiries, any new taking out of credit, um, making large expenses, purchases, um, even with cash just to ensure through the closing process nothing goes wrong. Because like, when you're in the closing process, costs can change. And say so you make a large purchase and then you end up short on funds, that could kill a deal. Okay. Um, if you take out a new line of credit, so say you're in the middle of a contract and then you decide to go uh, purchase a new car, um, that could kill a deal because of your debt to income could change, your credit score can drop, and all lenders are gonna monitor your credit. So they'll know if a new inquiry pops up and they're gonna ask about it. Um, so just avoid that because it can kill the deal. Now things happen. If you're gonna make a purchase or if you're thinking about it, I'd always run it by the lender and the realtor, yeah. right? You know, the realtor needs to know obviously what's going on to communicate and then the lender needs to know as well to make sure it's not gonna have a drastic impact. Mm -hmm. Now we're not gonna be able to see the true impact without actually occurring. Like if they're gonna buy a car, you know, we might be able to guesstimate, but until it actually happens, we won't know. Right. Um, so if they can during that process, even while they're home searching, try to avoid any of those, which sometimes is tough because, you know, you might be looking for a home for three months, mm -hmm. you know, six months, you know, your car breaks down, or you gotta buy some new furniture or, or whatever. Um, I would just avoid it. Unless you have a surplus of cash and it's mm -hmm. not gonna impact your your assets. You're okay. gonna still have plenty of funds to bring the closing. Okay, that's good to know. Oh. 
All right, guys, I have 10 minutes left on Zoom. Yeah. Uh, did you have a, another any question? Um, you spoke on um, areas, affordable housing areas. Mm -hmm. um, could you speak on, uh, on that here for uh, people who would uh, like to know about that? Yeah, so there is something called uh, LMI. Everybody likes acronyms. Um, LMI just stands for low to moderate income. And there are census tracts that the government puts in place and says this area is considered low to moderate income based off of that particular zip code or neighborhood's income level. So mm -hmm. what the average person makes. Now, if the income or if the area is considered LMI, then there's different opportunities as far as mortgage products. So mm -hmm. some companies will lend um, up to 100% financing. You know, they'll do. 97% finance, they'll do no no PMI, they'll do down payment assistance. Um, for somebody who lives in that area, uh, or somebody who makes below the income level, which is typically 80% of the median income. Mm. Now, there is another opportunity for people who might make over the income limit. If they purchase the area, they can also take, a, uh, take advantage of some of these loans as well. So if you're buying an area, the income doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But if you're not buying it in the area and you want to take advantage of like a low to moderate income loan, then you have to meet the income levels. Okay. So, and of course the whole premise around this, there's something called the CRA, the Community Reinvestment Act. It's all about uh, one, banks loaning in these areas, making sure that they're investing in these communities to uh, promote wealth, right? Make sure stimulate the economy, um, help development, um, you know, help people build wealth. And then two, um, it's just a way to entice people to move to that area, businesses move to that area, mm. and that of course stimulates that area. Mm. So, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you for that question. <laughs> <laughs> and no, I mean it's good because there's not a lot of ways for people to buy houses with no money down. Now, of course, there's still closing costs, mm -hmm. right? But you factor that in. Typically, you have to put down three or five percent, and then closing costs are typically three to five percent. Mm -hmm. So now you're looking at needing maybe up to ten percent of the sales price. Mm -hmm. So you know you have a say two hundred fifty thousand dollar house, and that's what twenty five thousand mm -hmm. you'll end up needing. But now you cut that in half, right? Now you only need twelve four, or you know twelve twelve two fifty mm -hmm. instead of the entire twenty five, whatever it may be. So it keeps more money in your pocket, more money in your bank. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So. so I have one more question, and as we kind of conclude, what what is this, uh, National, I think I believe it's National Home Ownership Month? It is still National Home Ownership Month. So, you know, we're at the end of it. Compared to, we don't have June June's numbers yet, but May, um, home sales dropped, what was it, 3.4% from April. And then I believe, Yearly is 8.6, drop 8.6 from last May. Mm -hmm. um, another thing, everybody out there who's looking to buy here soon and you know might not think there's any much available or afraid of the rates, one, and we can have Tyler touch base on that a little bit as far mm -hmm. as uh, getting refinanced. So it's still a great time to get a home. I know the rates aren't to your liking, but we're actually at a pretty pretty average level um, as far as just getting a good rate and then being able to refinance later. Um, for May, there was 1,060 homes that sold compared to last year where there was 1,038 homes sold uh, in May. And actually for the Pensacola area, that's actually a record for the Pensacola area, that 1,060. So wow. homes are still selling. There's still a lot of homes available uh, to be purchased out here and there's different loan types, you know, depending on your preference or what you want to go for, whether it's, you know, buying a home and fixing on it a little bit or, you know, buying a move-in ready home, there's different loan types, you know, that, that you guys can, can look into. Um, so, speaking of home ownership, I know I went off on that a little bit. Um, what is something that, I guess, a new owner can do as far as just being flexible with the owners? Like, I, when they get a mortgage, like, who all is on a mortgage? know and also as far as ownership of the home whose whose name is able to go on the title right no, that's a great question um so when you're looking at ownership and trying to 
find new ways, right, to get a home. If you're tired of rent and rent's going up, and you're trying to live cheaper, because we all know that rent, mortgage, those are gonna be your highest cost monthly. Mm -hmm. Fixed costs, but it's even most people's paychecks. Um, probably 28 to 30 percent of your paycheck might be going towards um, your rent or mm -hmm. your mortgage. So on a mortgage basis, I mean, you can two friends can go in one to buy a house together. Okay. They both could be on the mortgage now. If you're doing this and you're buying a house with somebody, you want them to make sure, two things, you want to make sure their credit is good, both parties' credit is good, because the lower credit is what your mortgage is going to be based off of. So if we buy a house together, whoever has lower credit between us, it's going to be what the qualifying credit score is going to be. So okay. that's going to determine our rate, right, our pricing. So just understanding where y'all credit is. Why is that exactly what you said? Um, so think of it like sports. Okay, so we have a basketball team. There's mm -hmm. five players. You're only as good as the weakest player. Mm -hmm. You know, that person is going to help you win or lose the game. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, they always talk about the sixth man, you know, and when it comes to, to loans, we're looking at the sixth man, like, all right, now this person has 800, so it's great. Mm -hmm. But the next person has a 500. Um, how's that going to impact the ability to pay? Because this person showing they can pay their bill, mm -hmm. this person cannot. So that can impact person paying their bills oh, um, that so that's it's an extra layer of risk uh, so just understand that and of course each other's debts and income because you know when you're both on a mortgage you're gonna look at both debts and both incomes and one person has a lot of debt that can also trap you in and cause you to be disqualified or qualify for less mm -hmm. uh, so just something to think about but you can also buy a house with somebody and as long as you can qualify by yourself they could be on the mortgage, and then two people be on the title. So, like, we both could buy a house, and I could be on the mortgage, or you could be on the mortgage, and we both could be on the title. Okay. Or, you know, if you have a fiance or a wife, or whatever. Now, there's certain states where there's community property states where if you are married, then no matter what, your spouse has to go on the title. Mm. Now, Florida is not a community property state. Um, Kentucky's not a community property state. Mm. So, there's certain states out there. But now, Texas, I believe Texas is a community property state. So, just depending, you know, either spouse has to be or doesn't have to be on the title, depending on the state. So, you know, you can always buy a home. And the good thing about not being on the mortgage or being on the title is you have ownership in that home, mm -hmm. but it doesn't show up on your credit, so it doesn't affect your debt to income. Now, to track, to backtrack, fun fact. yeah, to backtrack though, when you're on the title, you do have legal ownership, and that can cause issues when going to buy a home. Mm -hmm. So, say you've never bought a home. Okay. Somebody puts you on the title, you go to try to be a first time home buyer and buy a home, you'll disqualify because you have ownership in a property. Okay. So there are things you need to be aware of. I've always had people like, Oh, I'm gonna put my daughter on the title or, you know, so and so. It's like, all right, just understand there are repercussions for putting somebody on the title because when you're buying a home, they're gonna look at if you own any other homes, whether you're on the mortgage or on the title, because that's still a liability. You still have to pay taxes and insurance on a home. Mm -hmm. If that home foreclosed upon and you're on the title, you'll be liable for that foreclosure. So okay. there are risks for putting people on the title, so everybody needs to know the risk. And there's also a difference between the mortgage or the deed, or trust mm -hmm. what they call it, and the title. Mortgage is the note, so who pays? Title, who has ownership? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. It's almost no. kind of like having a co-signer for a car, in a way. Um, right, right. Yeah. anybody who's, who's ever... Yeah, so you have a co-signer. One person might pay, the other person's still liable, though. Still right. up on your credit. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, um, so uh, for everybody on Zoom, it's probably gonna cut out here soon. So we're just gonna kind of flow until it does. Um, if you're able to, mm -hmm. pop right on Facebook. Um, I've shared it. We've all shared it. Just click on that link. You can uh, hop on through Facebook if you do have any other questions. Um, but if not, you know, we're just gonna kind of continue to flow. Like I said, if you guys have questions, Destiny, you're very welcome. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, anybody on. Out. You know, one thing else I want to touch on is interest rates and APR. I feel like a lot of people get interest rates and APR confused. Mm -hmm. So, interest rate on your mortgage is what your monthly, like, what determines your monthly payment. Mm -hmm. APR, which stands for annual percentage rate, is what the money costs you. Okay. So it's like you want to focus on both, um, but just know interest rate determines what you pay every month. APR is the cost of money. So this hundred thousand, 
and this is why most lenders are the same. The difference is, is the cost. So like if you're shopping lenders, you want to look, yes, you want to look at the rate, but really you want to look at the APR because the higher the APR, typically the higher the cost. So I was like, all right, this lender's rate is 5.7, but their APR is 6.7. Mm -hmm. This lender's rate is 5.7, but their APR is 6.3. Mm -hmm. Their closing cost is, you know, 12,000. Their closing mm -hmm. cost is 9,000. So those are the thing. That's the main difference between interest rate and APR. People get confused. APR has nothing to do with your payment. Okay. Okay. It's all about the cost of money because money is not free. We all know right. that. <laughs> right. You know. So you, when you want to get money for the cheapest, yes, and that's where APR comes in. That hundred thousand costs more over there than over here. Okay. Now, while we on the interest rate topic, <clears throat> what are ways or steps one would have to take? Like anybody out there right now who's looking to buy a home and just hesitant because rates are kind of creeping up, um, knowing that we're still in one of the best times to actually purchase a home and mm -hmm. continue to, you know, gain wealth and have that wealth in the home. So five, ten years from now, you know, the uh, the profit that you'll get from that, whether you sell it or rent it out, you know, it'll be a lot. But what, mm -hmm. you know, I can ramble, guys. I'm sorry, you guys know I can ramble. Hey, real but estate I, is a great <laughs> way to build wealth. We all know that. Yeah. I want people to take advantage. So, like, what what are good ways somebody who, let's say they get their home now, rates 6%, 5%, you know, somewhere between there, mm -hmm. and 10 years from now, rates go down to, like, 4 or 3%. How can one go about refinancing? Yeah, I mean, there's a, a few different ways, and it depends on their goals at the time, mm -hmm. right? Um, I always look at things as an investment. So refinance is an investment. Because people don't realize there's a cost to refinance. Yeah, you might not come out of pocket, but that cost goes into your loan. Mm -hmm. So over time, you're going to be paying more for the refinance because you borrowed it, right? So it's like having a credit card mm -hmm. and you buy something for $100, but you never pay the, it off fully. So mm -hmm. that $100 costs you you know, 300 yeah. because of all the interest that builds right. up. So, you know, just knowing, and I understand some people don't have the, the funds to pull up. It, it, the, the costs are really staying the same for refinancing and purchasing. It's just there's no down payment typically. Uh -huh. But the closing costs outside of that is going to be typically the same. Um, you might not have the taxes either um, as far as, like, the county taxes when you get the new deed. But it's a new loan. And, you, you know, banks aren't giving out money for free. So right. they're going to charge the new loan whether you pay it out of pocket or you refinance it into the mortgage. Now, go to say is if you can lower your rate, you want to look at the savings. You can drop your monthly payment by a couple hundred dollars. It could be worth the refinance. So now you have to look at the recoupment. If it costs me five thousand to refinance, and I'm saving two hundred dollars a month, mm -hmm. how soon I'm gonna get my five thousand back? Exactly. That's what I'm gonna look at. Right. If I'm gonna get it back in three years, five years, whatever it may be, and I'm gonna be in this house for thirty years. It's gonna make sense because I'm making my money back. I break even, and the rest of it is just savings. Right. Um, or of course refinancing to cut your term. Most mm -hmm. people get a 30-year mortgage, which is great. But upfront on a 30-year mortgage, you know that you're paying mostly interest, probably for the first 10 years, and then you start chipping away more principal. Well, if you've been on a mortgage for say seven years and you want to refinance and cut down to a a 20-year mortgage or a 15-year mortgage, that's probably gonna make sense because obviously you're gonna pay it off sooner. Yeah. Some people have the desire to get mortgage free, um, and you could refinance to do that. Um, and then you have the cash out refinance. So maybe you have a business you want to start. Maybe you want to buy another house to invest, you know, as far as an investment or, or a second home, or you need to pay for a kid's college, or you got a lot of debt that's high interest rate. Maybe you can cash out the equity in your property, use that money to pay off debts, you know, to buy a new property, to invest it, to start a business. So it could be a good way to tap in your equity, refinance, mm -hmm. still at a lower rate, and have money in the bank, you know? You can cash, I mean, people, I've seen people cash out 100, 200,000, 300,000 that goes into the bank account, and that's their money. Mm -hmm. And if you're financially smart, you know, you use that money to put yourself in a better position. Exactly. Because um, exactly. obviously you're taking the equity out, you're stripping yourself of equity, but you obviously want to use it a way to benefit you. So there's a lot of ways you can take advantage of refinance um, to put yourself in a better position. Get a home. Get yourself a home where either it's a new build or a move-in ready home mm -hmm. and build on top of that equity. Yeah, you know. You gotta keep building, literally. That's one of the biggest proponents of wealth in our country. So I saw a stat that the PAR released, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe just NAR, National Association of Realtors. I think it was in the past 
10 years, homeowners have acquired 155,000 in wealth just through their home. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking about 155,000. Some people don't have that in a bank account. Some people right. don't have that in the retirement account. You know, some people mm -hmm. don't even make that in 10 years of work. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, um, and that's just based off of equity in their home. I believe I saw something similar. It was like 14. For anyone who purchased a home like within the last two years, their home value has went up about like 14% or something. Yeah, like I mean, right now, no Americans are, are sitting on trillions of dollars of home equity. Now, some of them can't tap into it because people waited to refi because of whatever reason. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now, people are sitting on trillions of dollars of wealth through their home. Um, and as you see, people have been selling their houses and cashing in and being able to buy houses cash due to that. Um, but yes, it, the old it's saying is <laughs> the old saying is don't wait to buy real estate, buy real estate and wait. wait. Oh, yeah. You know yeah, what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, you, on my page. Yeah, <laughs> on my personal you, page. <laughs> so, you know, real estate, there's going to be cycles. I don't be, oh, there's a bubble, it's going to burst, blah, blah, blah. Like, right now, we're in, in the y'all in the market, so it's there's not a lot of supply right, right. but there's right. high demand and exactly. what happens when you have no supply and high demand things go up exactly uh -huh. we're actually still considered to be in a strong seller's market mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so yeah. so is there anything you guys want to say before we you know wrap it up or any questions that anyone wants to ask um you know regarding real estate or you know no. And I'll also say so about mortgage rates. Know that all of the markets are tied together. So you have the stock market, mm -hmm. you get the real estate market, mm -hmm. you got the crypto market. Mm -hmm. um, you know any type of financial market, they're typically tied together. So when one's doing well, it can cause others to do bad. They can be inverted. So like for instance, if stock prices fall, typically bond prices rise. Um, and you know mortgage rates and real estate is not no different. Exactly. So for instance, they had the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, which mm -hmm. determines inflation, came out um, like two weeks ago, I think, and it was unexpectedly higher than they anticipated. Mm -hmm. So that's when we saw mortgage rates jump, mm -hmm. the highest one-week increase since like early 2000s or mm -hmm. something. And that's because, obviously, it was an economic shock. Yes. And what that did is cause bond yields to fluctuate, shoot them up, shooting up the interest rates. Um, now the feds, they raise rates. They raise them by 75 basis points last week. But the mm -hmm. feds rate doesn't impact mortgage rates directly. Okay. So the feds rate is for banks. It's the the rate that banks lend overnight money to each other. So okay. it's just the banks lending rate to each other. But it does impact other rates. So when you see like the feds rate raising rates, that's gonna impact like checking accounts and savings accounts, yeah. Yeah, certificates. But that also play impact on like bonds because what people are looking at now is right now bond prices like old bonds they might be say three percent interest. Well now they're issuing new bonds that are five percent interest. So people don't want the old bonds; they want the new bonds. Right. And that shift and that causes the market to sometimes go down and causes rates to go up. So the Fed rate doesn't directly impact mortgage rates, but it does have an adverse effect because it affects other things. Right. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah, yeah, so those are just, just, just knowing the, 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 the mortgage rates are tied to the bond market. Um, that's what's been causing the jump, though. It's mm -hmm. like when you have a poor uh, inflation reading mm -hmm. or, or, you know, those things. So it's just know. I mean, I don't know what rates are going to go. Uh, I wish I did. Mm -hmm. I'd right. be on a yacht right now, probably. <laughs> yeah, chilling. Uh, but, you know, the trend is been moving up. Mm -hmm. You know, how how will go? People predict seven percent. You know, will yeah, it go to seven percent? I don't know. I hope not, you know. Um but you know, we'll see. Right now like I said we're hovering around five point seven five to six. Uh, but what about the real estate market here? You know, what have y'all seen? Have prices been coming down any are sellers more willing to negotiate? Uh, yeah, we're we're kinda entering that phase, uh in fact, I believe the price, the average price for a home went from like 379000 down to about 376000 That's just, you know, like on average. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, things are 
slowly, slowly, um, you know, smoothing out. You know, okay. there's more opportunities for buyers compared to uh, the way it was last year when I wasn't an agent yet. Um, like when things were really, really hot. But just from you know seeing what I, what I've been, things I've been reading and, and hearing, you know, it was uh, it was uh, it was really crazy last year. But yes, yeah, it's, it's definitely been softening up a little bit. You know, right. easing up. But uh, you know. It's a lot in store, so yeah. yeah. There's a there's a lot of buyers out there, so you know, if you know anybody or if you are, you know, thinking about selling, the time is now. Um, you can get top dollar for your house right now, so that's a lot of buyers out there. Exactly. Um, now, for anybody who was able to view this, and like I said, even afterwards, if you have any questions, you at least know one of the first steps, one of the first things that you'll need to take care of, which is mainly finances, you know, financing the home, because that's going to be the most important. As he mentioned earlier, it's just like, it's just like, if you're currently renting, it's going to be the same exact thing. So now instead, we need to see how much you can pay per month. But on the bright side, you're actually, technically, you're paying yourself. You know what I mean? Aside from interest payments, you'll be paying yourself in this aspect when you're investing in a home. So uh, don't ever hesitate to reach out. Uh, once everything's uploaded, we'll share. We'll make sure we put our information. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you want, you can, um, anybody out there interested, I'll give my information. Everybody kind of get the information real quick. But uh, my email is gaybolar at kw.com. Website is gaybolar.kw.com. You can go on there, um, add, add me as your agent, download the app. And from there, I'm able to see anything that you're looking at as far as home. So I can, I can be on the same page with you to really assist you and take care of you the best way that I can. And um, of course, you know that's that'll be after Tyler gets you pre-approved, and you know how much you know how, you know how much those monthly payments are going to be. You know how much home that you can actually uh, invest in. But that's it for me. I really I appreciate y'all. I'm gonna go down the line here. Yeah. So again, I'm I'm, I'm Tyler Rafford. I work for Regions. So uh, yes, I'm a loan officer there. You can reach me easiest by myself, so you know, just call me 502-762-5059. I love to chat it up. I love to educate, um, walk through the process, um, you know, and I'll put my email in as well. It's just Tyler T Y L E R and then dot Rafford R A D F O R D at Regions.com. Let me get you in the home. Let me help you build some wealth, and uh, of course. Talk with these two guys about buying that home or selling your home because, you know, these are standout guys and the reason I work with them is because they do a great job. So, Absolutely. I appreciate these two gentlemen. I'm Kevin at um, Keller Williams Realty Gulf Coast. Um, my email is kevinhopkins at kw.com. Um, <clears throat> if you need anything, please don't hesitate to uh, contact me on my Facebook here. Uh, any real estate questions that we didn't answer or something that you would like to know um, I'd love to help you out uh, you can contact me at 850-341-0841 um, I'm free to help I'd love to help yeah you know, I think, I think we should uh, maybe do this like once a month and maybe we'll yeah. start giving out prizes yeah. sneak peek you know, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. Maybe, we'll, maybe we'll start giving out prizes giving out for everyone likes free stuff <laughs> exactly right, right. right. but hey man, build wealth one house at a time exactly like build wealth one house at a time build wealth one house at a time. Buy land, buy dirt, do what you gotta do. Gabe Bullock, Keller Williams Realty Gulf Coast. Kevin Hopkins, Keller Williams Realty Gulf Coast. Tyler Rafford, Regions Mortgage. We out. Thank y'all. We love y'all. <laughs> <laughs>